As we started this morning, we're going to continue on with part two of our series, The Story of Our Salvation. And part two is simply titled, Sacrifice. Now, as we talked this morning a little bit, as I read through this as a tradition every single year, the night he was betrayed, the crucifixion, and of course, the resurrection. As I read the crucifixion, I can't help but be in awe of what our Savior went through on our behalf. And as we go through this, we're going to do a lot of Bible flipping tonight, because like a puzzle to get all the pieces together, you have to kind of go back and forth between all the Gospels to get the the true picture. So tonight, our Bible study or lesson style is mostly going to be from Matthew 27, but we're also going to flip, flip to Luke 23 and also a little bit in John 19. So we're going to be doing a little Bible flipping tonight. Having said that, we're going to go into our first point tonight. Number one is the story of our salvation continues with sacrifice. And it continues with the sacrifice of humanity. Now, when we start in Matthew, the 27th chapter, verses 1 through 10, here we find we pick up right where we left off this morning. Our whole lesson this morning was about betrayal. And we saw the betrayal of all the things, the heart, the mind, and the soul. And we saw how Judas played a big part in that. Well, the betrayal that Judas had participated in has now come to fruition. And his guilt is sinking in. We pick up Matthew 27, 1 through 10, and here we find all the chief priests and all the scribes gathered together and they're so happy. They finally have gotten Christ. They finally got what they wanted. They've got him in bondage. And the guilt that Judas, that Judas had participated in this has finally weighed on him like a weight. And he comes through those doors and he tells them that I have delivered you the innocent blood. I have betrayed the innocent blood. And he throws the 30 pieces of silver down on the floor. And showing you the depravity, showing you the sacrifice of the humanity of these men, these Jews at the time, and their hatred, they say, what is that to us? See ye to it. Could you imagine that? That would be the equivalent of today being in a courtroom and someone being on trial for murder and a witness busts through the door and says, I have proof that this man is innocent. And the jury is saying, so what? See ye to that. Big deal. The hatred of these men. They were so happy to have Christ in their midst. And they didn't care what it took. And of course, after this, Judas, throwing the money down, he left the place and he hung himself. One of the saddest, saddest endings to a story in the Bible you're ever going to hear. A man that could have had so much promise. A Christian that was as close to Christ as anyone could be in this life. A life wasted. After this, the sacrifice of the humanity didn't end. As we move forward again into Matthew 27, this time verses 11 through 25. Here we find where... The Jews have now brought Jesus Christ before the regional governor, Pontius Pilate. The Roman governor of this territory at the time. And they say that they brought him before Pilate and they said, this man has made himself above Caesar. He's saying he's a king. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus Christ answers, thou sayest. And they go on and on and on, the Jews, with all these things he's guilty of. And Pilate says, don't you hear what all these things, what all they say, what all they're witnessing against you? And Christ says nothing. So much, in fact, that Pilate marvels at this. 
He's used to having people in this state begging for their life, pleading for their life, asking anything, coming up, I'm sure, with a list of excuses. Could you imagine if you and I were in chains and brought before a judge and we were innocent? We'd be pleading, wouldn't we? We'd be pleading our case. We'd be doing anything we could to prove our innocence, to try to save our life. Christ says nothing. Why? Because He knows this has to be done. So they go on and Pilate says, well, after questioning him a little bit, I see no fault in this man. I find nothing wrong with him at all. The position that Pilate has put in in this situation has got to be one of the most interesting you're ever going to find. Here he is. He finds no fault in Christ. They're sitting there screaming and hollering. He's done all these things wrong. He's guilty of this. He's guilty of that. And if that wasn't enough, in walks his wife. And she says, have nothing to do with this just man because I've suffered many things in a dream today because of him. A little bit more pressure put on Pilate. So he says, well... I know what I'll do. I'll chastise him a little bit. I'll scourge him. Send him back out to the people. That'll satisfy him. It doesn't. They begin to get even more tempestuous, even more crazy as it goes on. And Pilate says, what evil has he done? Crucify him. Crucify him. They begin to scream. And so he begins to think about it. And he begins, a little light bulb goes off in his head. Well, it's the time of the Passover. And it's a tradition that I, a Roman, release to you one of these prisoners. And I've got a perfect one. They'll never go for this. In my midst right now, I have a murderer named Barabbas. And they'll surely free him instead of this Jesus. So he offers. Who will you have me release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Thinking that this would appease them. They're never going to release a murderer over a guy that's just claiming to be a king, right? Pilate didn't know who he was dealing with. And he underestimated the hatred of men. He underestimated the sacrifice of humanity. They begin to scream even louder after he offers Barabbas, release to us Barabbas. What shall you have me do with Jesus known as Christ? Crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate seeing no other options, he takes a political exit. And he goes over to a basin of water and in front of the crowd washes his hands. And he says, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See ye to it. And what is their reply? May his blood be on us and on our children. Could you imagine saying that? Could you imagine having the hatred in your heart to see someone put to death that you didn't even care if it not only condemned you, but condemned your children? That's hatred. That's as deep of hatred as it can possibly get. And that's what our Savior faced. The sacrifice of humanity. It got to the point, in fact, where they even said, Pilate says, that they are a king. And he's made himself a king. And they say, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar in John 19 and verse 15. Here they're claiming to take part with Caesar, the very person Rome had condemned and had taken this area of Jew Jerusalem under its wing at this time. It was under oppression. Could you imagine saying that? They would rather side with Caesar, side with Rome, than see Christ released. The hatred saw no end at this point. And Pilate saw it. 
There was no way of getting out of this. But he knew he was innocent. He knew that they had delivered Christ for envy. He says, my hands are innocent of the blood of this just man. See ye to it. I've often thought this is one of the wildest scenarios. In this scenario, the most sane person, the most rational person is the vicious Roman dictator. The most sane person, the most rational, the most compassionate person in this instance is Pilate. That shows you the depravity of the Jews at this time. The sacrifice of humanity. That's how Jesus Christ's Good Friday began. But we go on. Number two is Point number two is the sacrifice of our Savior. We move forward into Matthew 27. Now this time, we move ahead to verses 26 to 44. And here we find that Pilate has now given them what they wanted. Go ahead, see ye to it, crucify him, do what you will. I'm giving you all you need to put this man to death. But no, I believe he's innocent. So as far as Pilate's concerned, it's over. The matter's over. And for him, it probably was. He probably saw a death daily, many deaths, and ordered this kind of thing all the time. So they take him on, and the Roman guard takes him on, and from this point on, we begin to see the sacrifice, the true physical sacrifice of our Savior. They put him in a robe and they place a crown of thorns down upon his head. And they begin bowing the knee before him saying, Hail the king! As they spit on him and take a reed that they had fashioned to make it look like a scepter and they smote him over the head. And then they scourged him and took a whip, which is a, or a scourging is a whip that has spikes on it. And they would whip your back until they literally ripped the flesh off of it. Then they took the robe off and put him back in his own clothes. And his reward is he gets to be carry a cross to his death. And as he's doing this, he's so weakened by what he's been through, the scourgings, the beatings, that he can't even carry his own cross. They have to have Simon, a Cyrenian, come along and help him bear the burden of the cross. And as he's going along in Luke 23, verses 32 to 30 to 43, in the beginning of 32 here, we find that women are following along as Christ is carrying the cross and they're lamenting and weeping for him. And he turns and says to them, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and weep for your children. And then he proceeds to get to Calvary, to get to Golgotha, and his reward for finishing the journey with help from Simon to get to carrying the cross to where he's going to be crucified is he gets to be thrown to the ground and have a spike driven through each hand and through his feet. And he gets to be hoisted into the air where he slowly gets to bleed and suffocate to death. And as he's looking down, as we follow Matthew's account, he gets to see a beautiful panorama as he slowly dies. He gets to see all these people jeering him and mocking him and saying, if you are the Christ, come down from that cross. We'll believe you. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Can you imagine what was going through the mind of Christ as he hung there? Knowing that he had the power to come down from that cross any second he felt like it. But what did he do? In Luke 23, verse 34, he utters the word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even as he's in this state, he has the presence of mind to forgive those who are laughing at his death. And another interesting point, if you Matthew 27, verse 36, we find, and only in Matthew's account, we find they're sitting down 
Those that are watching him be crucified are sitting down and watching this as a spectacle. This is entertaining to them. They've made a whole event out of this. They're not going to bother standing. They're going to sit and relax and watch the show. And as they put the reed to his mouth, he keeps turning it away. And he keeps looking out over this crowd and seeing all these things. And as he's hanging there and forgiving them, for they know not what they do, on either side of him is a thief that's being crucified with him. And one of those thieves begins nailing him too and begins berailing him. If you're the son of God, get out of this situation. Show us something. But the other thief said, this man's guilty of nothing. We're, we deserve to be here. This man's done nothing amiss. And he begins to say, Lord, when you go into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus answered, today you will be with me in paradise. Even on the cross, as he's dying, he's forgiving the crowd of people who are putting them to death, and he's forgiving the soul of a man who was guilty of who knows what. As he's dying, this is the love that your Savior had for you and me. Even in his last breaths, he's still forgiving. And if that wasn't bad enough, the sacrifice of our Savior continues. We go to John's account in John 19, verses 25 to 27. As he continues to hang there, we're told in John's account, in John's account, how he looks down from the cross and who does he see? His own mother and John, the disciple he loved. And once again, having the presence of mind as he's near death, he tells John, behold your mother. And he tells her, behold your son. Even as he's dying, he's thinking about his own earthly mother and that she will be taken care of after he's gone. Can you imagine having that presence of mind? And so after all these things are fulfilled, he's getting near the end. He's forgave all those who were in the presence that day, forgave the thief that was on the cross near him, and he's even made sure that his mom would be taken care of. He's nearing the end. And so we move on to point number three. Point number three is the sacrifice for us all. As he's near the end, he's drawing his last breaths and he's hanging on the cross. The skies begin to darken. And we're told in Matthew's account as we go to Matthew 27 verses 45 to 60. Here we find that Jesus Christ, according to Matthew's account, in one of his last words, utters the words, Why has my father, why has thou forsaken me? My God, my God, why has thou? forsaken me. A lot of folks will think and believe that a lot of times he was in such agony that he utters these words and he was. They believe that he utters these words because he felt like God had left him at the moment. Like he had forgotten about him. But no, Jesus Christ is fulfilling prophecy. If you go to Psalms chapter 22, here you'll find that David on his deathbed and near the end of his life utters the exact same words. Here David says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They've pierced my hands and my feet. They've cast lots for my vesture. But thou was always with me. Jesus Christ is uttering the same words that David uttered at the end of his life. Even at the end of Christ's life, he's still fulfilling the scripture. If you go to Luke's account and Luke's account, the last words that Christ was accounted of saying in Luke 23, verse 46, is my father into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And in John's account in John 19 
and verse 30, Jesus Christ simply says, it is finished. So Christ's last words were into your hands. I commend my spirit and it is finished. And then he gave up the ghost. And after he did so, we're told that this temple was rent in two and that there was earthquakes and great things began to happen. Following this, in Matthew 27, verse 54, the Roman centurion that was there pierced his side and blood and water flowed. And after seeing all the things that he had seen, he utters those words, truly this was the Son of God. Truly it was. And truly this was the sacrifice for us all. On this last day of Christ's life, we see the sacrifice of humanity. We saw the sacrifice of a savior, the sacrifice for us all. Three nails plus one cross equals four given. And that's what you and I were. Do we remember this enough in our life? We remember it beyond Easter, beyond just this time of year. Are we thankful for what Jesus Christ and what God gave us? I've often wondered when those skies were darkened out, I've often wondered if God did that on purpose because he couldn't stand to see any more. That was our Savior. And that's why you and I are sitting here this evening with the hope of an eternal life. Are we grateful? Are we thankful? And do we remember? The story of our salvation continued with sacrifice. Lord willing, folks, next week, next Sunday night, I will have the last part, part three, resurrection. I thank you and the lesson is yours. If there's anyone here tonight who's heard God's words, been moved to believe it, you have the chance to come forward. Let God know you've heard that you believe. Repent of the sins you've committed in life. Confess Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. If for some reason you feel like you're not as close to God as you want to be right now, there are faithful men here to pray you come back and be restrengthened. If you have those needs, won't you come as we sing the song of invitation?